Hello everybody. Uh, let's get started. We have a very inspirational and insightful afternoon with a lot of uh, presentations. Uh, really a great number of prominent speakers. Uh, our first session today uh, is dedicated to the role of biomarkers in personalized medicine and will be presented by Dr. Lubov Simeonova, who is a medical oncologist from the uh, Medical University of Sofia, and she has uh, extensive experience uh, in oncology. She participated in many international projects uh, based in Germany, in Italy, Israel, uh, her professional interests uh, dedicated to gastrointestinal cancers to, as well as uh, breast and gynecology cancer. So thank you very much for joining and uh, I will hand over to, to Lubov. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you for the nice introduction, Dr. Borisov. Um, I'm not sure it is okay. Uh, we can see it. We can see it. Okay. Uh, I'm really happy uh, to attend this year Biotech Atelier. It is a great pleasure for me, and I'm really excited uh, precisely because of the uh, the focus of my speak today, the role of biomarkers in personalized medicine. Uh, the area of personalized medicine develops in the recent years very fast and they, it gives us, uh, us, the medical oncologists and our patients, uh, new treatment options and even a hope for a cure. So why the tailoring of treatment to patients dates back from, to the time of uh, Hippocrates? Uh, the term has risen in usage in recent years, given the growth of new diagnostic and informatic approaches and developments in chemistry, histochemistry, and microscopy allowed the scientists to begin to understand the underlying causes of disease. Sequencing of the human genome at the turn of the 21st century set in motion the transformation of personalized medicine from an idea to an established practice. The term personalized medicine is often described as providing the right patient with the right drug at the right dose at the right time. The public was uh, introduced to the term for the first time on April 16, 1999, when a short article appeared in uh, a Wall Street Journal entitled New Era of Personalized Medicine, targeting drugs for each unique personal pro genetic profile. More broadly, personalized medicine may be thought of as the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual characteristics, needs, and preference of a patient during all stages of care, including prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. Where did the need for personalized medicine come from? Uh, as you all know, the different illnesses could have similar symptoms and medical interventions may work in some people, but not in all cases. 40% of drugs that are taken are not as effective as we thought. The personalized medicine could give us uh, an option to avoid allergic and adverse effects for some patient subpopulations and the advantages in genomics help us to treat our patients more precisely and effectively. Personalized medicine can improve efficiency within the healthcare system and as you can see on the graphs below, personalized medicine can more quickly target the right treatment for the right patient, pinpoint optimal dosing, prevent adverse events and improve both patient outcomes and efficiency across the healthcare system. When we start the treatment of a patient with biomarker diagnostic, we can divide patients according to their biomarkers and we can give our patients individualized treatment that each patient benefits from. 
As you can see from this slide, the percentage of patient population which is considered on average ineffective is up to 75% uh, for cancer drugs. And that is the primary reason why most of the efforts associated with uh, personalized medicine are focused precisely on new treatment options for cancer patients. A better understanding of the heterogeneity of cancer biology has prompted the identification of targetable driver mutations as biomarkers. In recent years, there has been an increase in use of biomarkers to identify patients who may benefit from precision medicine. As, as you can see, the percentage of FDA approvals rise in the recent years, and there are many new precision medicines that are approved. The percentage correlates with the percentage of oncology trials that grow patients based on biomarker testing. So what is actually a biomarker? The biomarker is characteristic that objectively measures and evaluates normal biological processes, pathogenical processes, and biological responses to a therapeutic intervention. Biomarker testing can be used to increase the effectiveness of treatment. We can use them to support the medical decision regarding diagnosis, specific treatment, dosage, and we can, they can help us for prevention or primary prevention, and you can, you, we can use them as a prognostic value also. So what is ideal biomarker? Is there such as? I don't think we are there yet, but if there was, it should show a significant increased expression, especially in the related disease condition. It also should show a correlation with an interested outcome progression. It would be econo economical, excuse me, quick and consistent. And finally, it should be quantifiable accessi in accessible biological fluids or clinical samples. There are three types of biomarkers. The first type, type zero, are markers of the natural history of disease and they correlate longitudinally with non-clinical indices such as symptoms over the full range of disease, for example, CRP. The second type, type one biomarkers, known also as biological or drug activity markers capture the effects of an intervention in accordance with the mechanism of action of the drug. And the final, the third type, type two biomarkers, are considered to be surrogate endpoints, and we can use them as an intended a substitute for a clinical endpoint and benefits. Biomarker testing is critical for the selection of appropriate targeted therapies, and they provide insight into diagnosis, prognosis, and the patient's likelihood of responding to certain treatments. Early biomarker testing can facilitate intervention with appropriate target agents as soon as we have the right diagnosis. Therapies targeting driver mutations are also associated with improved response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival across cancer types. Precision medicine guides treatment decision towards potentially clinical benefits for the patients. As, as you can see, there is an increase of 10 years overall survival of targeted therapies versus non-targeted six times, and there is also increase of targeted efficiency with medium PFS survival and response rate for versus cytotoxic agents and therapies. Testing to identify driver mutations and their associated targeted therapy lowers costs across cancer types. There is a 21% relative reduction of the average per week healthcare cost when compared to chemotherapy or best supportive care. I think this is because we reduce the cost of an inefficient, an inefficient treatment, and also we can rely when we have a targeted therapy on a durable response that gives our patients better quality of life, uh, less hospitalization, emergency room hospitalizations, outpatient and inpatient hospitalizations. I will focus today on lung cancer. Why lung cancer? You all know that this is uh, the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, and non-small cell lung cancer accounts for 80-85% of all lung cancers. Most patients are diagnosed at an advanced stage, and these patients in advanced stage are with low survival rates. 
Molecular testing of lung cancer remains suboptimal, and according to the lung cancer statistics, uh, estimated 1.8 million deaths occurred worldwide in 2018 due to a lung cancer. Also, lung cancer is very immunogenic. Uh, what does it mean, immunogenic? It means that it has uh, various mutations. Many of them are uh, mutations that pr promote cancer. We can use them as biomarkers and we can try to find uh, targeted therapies according to these biomarkers for our patients. As you can see uh, of the pie chart here, the most prevalent driver mutations in non-small cell lung cancer are KIRAS and EGFR. And we have already using as inhibitors that are targeted therapies for the patients with EGFR positive mutations, but we still don't have treatment for the patients with the KIRAS mutations. And we know that uh, the patients with this kind of mutations are with uh, uh, war survival and they don't answer of the standard agents of chemotherapy, some of them. And 13% of the patients with non-small non cell lung cancer have the KIRAS G12C mutation, which is almost prevalent as EGFR mutations. Kirsten Ratzer viral oncogen homolog KIRAS is one of the most frequently mutated oncogens in human cancers. Despite the discovery of KIRAS almost 40 years ago, there is currently no approved therapy targeting KIRAS. KIRAS G12C mutation is actually glycine to cysteine substitution at position 12 that promotes tumor genesis and it's found approximately in 13% of the patients with non-small cell lung cancer and 3-5% of the patients with colorectal cancer and 1-3% of other solid tumor patients. What does actually KIRAS G12C mutation? It favors uh, active state of a protein. Uh, this protein promotes cancer growth and survival due to activation of signaling pathways. You can see on the left, uh, the left picture on the slides that this signaling goes to the nucleus and it activates cancer growth and survival. Targeted therapy that locks the KIRAS G12C mutant protein in inactive state could prevent oncogenic signaling without affecting Y-type KIRAS signaling. Guideline-based biomarker testing is associated with favorable outcomes among non-small non cell lung cancer patients. You see increase of overall survival with 19% and decrease of the mortality rate with 23%. Genetic biomarkers can be assessed using tissue or liquid biopsy. What are the differences between these two methodologies? Tissue biopsy analyzes tissue that is extracted from the primary tumor or metastasis, and it's a gold standard for this kind of procedures. But it captures only composition of the tumor sample that is biopsied, and it is an invasive procedure. Uh, it has some issues because of the limited tissue quality and limited tissue quantity and the time to result may be delayed due to an inadequate tissue samples or complicated tissue proce processing requirements. In comparison, the liquid biopsy analyzes cell-free DNA that is collected from blood sample and it is a minimally invasive procedure, which is good, and it captures heterogeneity of tumors from all sides of the patient with all metastases, but it may not detect non-shedding tumors, and it also has higher false negative rates. Uh, the time to results here is faster because of the invasive procedure, but the liquid biopsy is still not routine in our practice. There are many trials that are focused on the uh, right place for the liquid biopsy in our guidelines, in our practice, but still there is uh, no consensus on this. Uh, pro probably this will be uh, very suitable for patients uh, that uh, are unfit uh, for invasive sampling uh, or the metastatic sites are inconvenient for sampling or will it be appropriate when we have insufficient tissue available. So in summary, personalized medicine has a lot of advantages. It reduces the burden of the disease. It also could give us help and, uh, uh, and for cure for our patients. And it focuses on prevention and diminishes the duration and severity of illness. And, and last but not least, it reduces healthcare costs and gives our patients a better 
quality of life. Biomarkers can help identify patients who may benefit from precision medicine. Targeted therapies have been shown to improve clinical and economic outcomes across cancer types. According to NCCN guidelines, the biomarker testing in eligible patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer are, can improve our clinical outcomes. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Semyonova. Uh, I would encourage the uh, audience to not only to ask questions, but also to use the chat. And if we cannot address the question during the presentation, we can uh, forward the question received by chat uh, to the speaker, uh, thanks to our uh, team. Oh. I was in, astonished to, to, to find out that the first time personalized medicine was used in Wall Street Journal. I was expecting this to be New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you, you get to the point about liquid biopsy. We will have later on uh, a presentation about that. But I would like to let me abuse my position and ask the question first. Uh, we frequently see patients with cancer where we see more than one mutation yes in addition to uh, KRAS as you say we may also have EGFR but we may have another uh, and we see that quite often another uh, mutation so how in your practice uh, you deal with uh, picking up the driving mutation and do you think Another question in addition, do you think that artificial intelligence will help someday because it's coming closer and closer? I think, uh, yes. Uh, there are many mutations. Uh, um, so Kiras, EGFR, cross. there are many mutations, especially for the lung cancer patients. And we are, um, sometimes we are not able to, to take biopsy from the tumor sites. And I think this is the reason we are searching for liquid biopsy as an answer to our questions to, to see which is uh, the mutation that's prevalent in the metastasis in the different metastatic sites. And I think the, the, these intelligent uh, um, re resources that we can use in future will help us to guide us uh, the potentially usage of uh, no new uh, target therapies for the patients according to their mutations or combination of targeted therapies. Uh, it, it's possible. I think it's a future. Dr. Simonova, we have a question from one of our panelists, um, Dr. Luis Correa. Um, he is asking, in your opinion, do you see that liquid biopsy could move faster to routine use if we consider that the context of a tumor board? Yes, I think I think so because yeah, there is a high rates of uh, negative, false negative rates, but uh, also we could use it more frequently, and we can use it also in the beginning of the treatment. It could guide us uh, for treatment uh, answer, answer to the treatment, and also it could guide us if we are on the uh, on the right path with this patient. I think so. It, it's the future for me, but we need a little bit to focus on the procedure and the methodology of the procedure, and to be more precise. And I think it will be it will be in use soon. Thank you. And we also have one other question that covers um, this one as well, but there is an addition as well. Um, can the liquid biopsy be used for each cancer uh, or not? Because if we talk about brain tumors, is there a reason to take a blood sample as liquid biopsy? Thank you. Uh, for the most of the tumors, I think we can use liquid biopsy. Uh, it depends uh, uh, of that if the brain tumor is already um, um, 
cured or already use radiotherapy because uh, the the um, uh, brain tumors when you use radiotherapy we can damage the brain tissue and we can damage the, the sur surface of the brain and then we should be able to to have samples also from the uh, free dna from the brain tumor also but it depends on the stage of the patient and i think in the future yes and it depends on the patient and the cure that we use till now. May I ask another one, another question? Uh, unless we don't have a question from the auditorium, because you mentioned uh, PFS versus uh, overall survival, and uh, we both know because we know each other for quite a long time. We both know that. Uh, many oncologists are still reluctant to to trust results based on progression free and uh, i've been asked and being asked uh, when shall we be back to only to overall survival so would you elaborate a bit, a, a bit of this uh, reluctance to accept because sometimes overall survival comes that in in few years and patient cannot wait and we cannot wait either so how we can build additional trust in progression free as a uh, quite reliable endpoint accepted by FDA, EMA and the big regulatory, regulatory agencies? Hmm. A difficult question. Uh, I personally, personally, I, I think uh, it depends uh, of the state of the patient. Uh, when we don't have many more options for this patient, we can try to put this patient in clinical trials and we can rely on new treatment options. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the progression-free survival is a good prognostic factor for potentially um, overall survival rates. Uh, and I think uh, it depends it's personalized medicine, actually. I think it, it, it depends on the case of the patient and the uh, treatment options in the country that we talk of and uh, the, the willing of the patients to participate in clinical trials, of course, and to try a new, uh, new target drug, for example, because the patients sometimes are very happy with target drugs, but sometimes they are very skeptic about them. And it's, it depends on the case. But... I think we should have more hope in the data we see and in the rationale of the data we see and the mechanism of action of uh, the drug we use. And we, when we have reasons to believe that drug targets exactly, uh, for example, Kiras, Kiras is uh, a very bad prognostic factor for these patients. And we have in our practice patients with Kiras mutations that came to us, they don't, they don't have any other mutations. They try to find a um, cure, but there is no such. So if we had an option for targeted therapy for these patients, and we know that Kiras positive patients don't answer some of the platinum or gemcitabine or so uh, uh, toxic agents, so we can try, why not? Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. and uh, perfect timing. So, unless we don't have uh, other questions from from the chat, uh, many thanks for, for the presentation and opening this discussion. We will have more uh, presentation about uh, cancer later on during the uh, during the journey. So, I hope we will be able to consolidate uh, our questions and. Um, if we will not be able to, again, I would, uh, I would like to uh, say that if we will not be able today to answer all of them, we will forward them to, to our speakers. So many thanks, Dr. Simeonov, and very Thank good you. work in, in, 